Hi, it's Margaret Nichols, and I'm so excited because this week we have a super, super special treat. My friend Elizabeth D'Alto is here to chat with us, and I'm so excited to have her on here because she just released a brand new book, and I'm going to read you the title here. It's called Untame Yourself, Reconnect to the Lost Art, Power, and Freedom of Being a Woman, and it is a number one bestseller in women's personal spiritual growth on Amazon. Congratulations for that, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yeah. And when it was released, it was released, I think it was the 17th of November and I was in Peru. So I managed to download it, but I didn't really get a chance to read it and I was offline. So I didn't get to kind of, you know, participate in the excitement of promoting it and reading it and being able to share about it. So I want to take a chance to be able to read it and then share it with all of you because it's also an unbelievable price at $2.99. So it's a must, <laughs> must download, a must read. Thank you for doing that. And, you know, Elizabeth has been, we've been, we've no, I've known about you certainly for years and we've been friends for a couple years. We, we met, I can't remember the first time that we met in person, but um, it's been amazing watching her transformation. She's been a leading coach for years and years and years, you know, coming from the kind of fitness industry and now transitioning into creation of the wild soul movement, which is this global movement of women. And I just, I love watching her lead it and participating in it. And it's been really incredible watching your transformation over the last few years. You know, really going from this space of, you know, not even just physically moving from New York City and all the changes in your body, but just seeing you really blossom and bloom in this gorgeous woman. And I just love everything that you talk about. I love how genuinely and authentically you share on social media and in your newsletters and in all your writing. And so I was really thrilled that you had written this book because it's such an easy way to share your work for, with anyone. And it so closely coincides with everything that I've been doing with women the last couple of years. And just women need to hear this message. You know, it's time for us to rise and to be empowered in this way. So I, I want to thank you so much for writing this book to make it so accessible to everybody. Thank you. Um, and it's so interesting. I just, I, for so many years, I thought about writing a book, you know, and you and I, we have so many mutual friends, yeah. know so many people who have written books. And for a while I did that stubborn thing. Well, it's like, well, everyone else is writing a book. I don't want to, which yeah. is just stupid. Like it's not in service. Like that was very egoic, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't want to copy. I don't want to like get on the bandwagon, but I'm like, I didn't even realize, um, like a week before it was coming out, something popped for me. How um, sometimes, you know, even with an internet business, mm -hmm. uh, you just feel like, great, I can have this global reach. I can help people all over the world. But then there's also like, okay, how do I reach more people? Like, mm -hmm. how do I have more impact? And like you said, it's, it's two dollars and ninety nine cents to download the Kindle version. The print version will be out early in two thousand sixteen. A book is so accessible, even even just in terms of what people can afford. Yeah, because it like crushes me every time I get a message from someone that's like, I would love to work with you, and I I can't afford it. And now there's just like this way to be like, here, take this thing, like, and and anyone can access this that I didn't realize was actually weighing on me that I didn't have something like that before. Mm -hmm. So that just feels good now. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, you know, I'd love to chat about it. I took so many little notes because I'm such a good little student. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have all these questions. We'll get, we'll get through a, a few of them. But, um, you know, first I just want to talk about just the, the movement practice and how it developed for you. Because I took a Wild Soul class with you. I don't know if you remember it. Soul Camp. Right, Soul Camp. Last yes. year. And it was so beautiful because I know in my own transition, I'm the same a person that was like the seven day a week gym rat. I mean, I mean, 15 years ago, I would do like the step class and the body lifting class right after, you know? And then I was like, and even when I got into yoga, I was into Ashtanga yoga, which is like an hour and a half every day. You have to go, you have to go. And in in my evolution, in my own like spiritual evolution, the evolution of my being, I think part of it might also have to do with getting older, but also paying attention to what my body wants and needs. You know, I probably work out less now than I ever have in my entire life. But movement and energy through my body is hugely important. It's, it's such a priority. And so all the practices that you lead people through in the book are to just kind of get in your body. And so I would love for you to speak a little bit about that, because I think that, you know, 
one of the biggest things is that the women, like womankind, is very disassociated from her body. Just we've, yes. we've been pressed down for so many millennia, such shaming. You know, we've been sexual objects. We've been objectified. You told a story in the book, which is like heartbreaking, about feeling objectified when you were 12 years old. And like I read that and I thought, oh, what a horrible thing for like a little girl to experience and have to carry with her. So I would love to you just to kind of speak to that. You talk about it a lot in the book, just, just in your own words now about what that transition was like for you. Yeah, well, and, and you, I, I do remember the first time we met at Erin Stutland's birthday party in like 2011 on oh, wow. rooftop. So, um, so, you know, I come from that fitness world and I was a personal trainer for many years teaching group exercise classes and, and kind of like a lot of people, like similar even to how you described your journey, I just started to realize like in my own body and even in, in clients, people can get like the physical external aspects down. They could eat well, they could work out all the time, but then inevitably there would be some mental, emotional or spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. that would come up and absolutely derail everything. Mm -hmm. And not only derail everything, but like the speed with which a life issue could just wipe out any physical progress was like incredible to me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I became so curious about that, right? And and so I became more interested in working in than working out. And, and it also just like there was this turn of events where um, I just really didn't want to be a personal trainer anymore. And I was trying to build my online business, but I was having this conflict of like, I just don't even care. Like I was still making workout videos for YouTube and I'm like, I literally don't give a crap right. about this, you know? Um, and, and that's where I was, I was a bit dissociated, not from my, yeah, from my body, because from my soul, right? And I don't believe they're separate. Mm -hmm. your, your body, your physical sensations, it's how your soul communicates with you and through you and sends you messages. So um, I was, I was super disconnected at the time too, because I was still trying to do all these things that everyone else was telling me that I should be doing. And so, you know, it all started, I started doing energy work. I did three Reiki, I got three Reiki attunements. And, and I was just so much more interested in studying the subtle body, the yeah. chakra system. I did actually get into yoga for the first time, but there was still something about yoga that was so masculine to me mm -hmm. because it was so structured, right? Like, tuck your belly in, pull your shoulders back, do this, put your foot there, do that little, you know, articulation. And I'm like, yeah, just stop telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, it's actually super beautiful. Do you know Rochelle Chic? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I went on this study of sensual movement, and um, I read a book called Maps to Ecstasy by Gabrielle Roth. Have you ever heard of it? No, I haven't read that book. So she's the creator of Five Rhythms. Yeah, I love Five Rhythms. And, and so I had done some some pole dancing, some S Factor, mm -hmm. and and those like hip circles and the warm up, like they're just like these really slow, sensual, juicy movements that always made me feel quite different than anything else. Mm -hmm. And then um, I remember reaching out to Kate Northrup because Kate knows everyone and being like, okay, sensual movement, who do I study? And she sent me to take Koya with Rochelle, mm -hmm. which at the time we were both living in Venice Beach in um, – in LA. Mm -hmm. So I, I took some Koya classes. And so I, I started to just like get all these like inspirations. But at that point, it became completely sensual in terms of how does this make me feel? Yes, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So the evolution of Wild Soul Movement, when I first created it, it was still combining. Um, I still had some fitness. Like there was still like some like exercise in the beginning and then the sensual movement at the end. Uh -huh. And then I was like, ha, huh, no, like every time I tested it, cause I did some beta groups, I gradually took the exercise, like the, the sweat exercise out mm -hmm. until eventually it was just, um, the movement. And then I had also combined it with a little bit uh, like meditation and one mantra, one mantra per class. Mm -hmm. Cause the idea, like you remember you took a soul camp. The idea is, you know, it, layering, right? The messaging with the movement, with the feeling, with the meditation, uh, really, really effectively it helps people to release things, but also like reprogram, like put what you want in its place, but all through like that that felt experience, not just talking about it because we talk so much, yeah. you know. <laughs> totally, um, I love everything that you're saying about that, and let me um. Let me go further with that because something that you talk about a lot and that I talk about a lot too, which is really like, you know, feel the feels, right? Yeah, and yeah. to really that you need <laughs> to experience it and go through it. And you have a whole, I think we have even a whole chapter in your book about spiritual bypassing yes. and, and that and how so many people, and I find this still to be true, although less true than it was maybe five years ago, but there are so many people that are like, I want to be light. I want to be the unicorn. I want to be sparkles, sparkles, sparkles. And they 
you know, I, I find that's a big problem that I have with people. It's like just trying to kind of pull them back and, and see the value of looking into that darkness and being really yes. authentic. Yes. And I'd love for you to um, express a little bit how your life has changed since you've really kind of embraced, you know, being in anger when you're angry, being in, you know, sadness, you know, any really allowing yourself to experience the rainbow of emotions and what it looks like on the other side of that. Yeah. And I'll tell you a quick funny story. The other day I had someone reach out. <laughs> we got an email that said, I have to leave your newsletter. I just, my opinion of, of Liz has changed. And we were like, cool. Just curious. Why? Mm -hmm. And she said, I feel like, I feel like she's happy on the outside and angry on the inside. And, and we responded. We were like, yeah, like, of course she is sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes she's also like frustrated, hurt or sad or joyful, blissful, enthusiastic. Like, when it comes time to like make a video or do something, you know, I get to put those things aside and show up however is my best. But that was just such an indicator how people go, this emotion is okay and this emotion is not. Interesting. Yeah. Like, like to that woman, I was like somehow inauthentic because I had some kind of internal feeling that she thought she was perceiving, okay. right? Who knows if it was a projection or not, but like, hell yeah, like, and I get to be angry. So here's what has changed for me. My partner, Michael, has really helped me with this a lot because when we first got together, when we first moved in together, actually, he's like, I feel like you have some anger. And I was like, no, I'm good. <laughs> and then it was just like poking like the tiger in the cage. I remember oh one day God. I was actually like making the bed and he, I remember he was saying something to me and I was like, you know what? You're right. I like threw a pillow. I'm like, I am angry. Um, and I think it is. I think for women, we do get this programming, whether it's subtle or overt, and it comes from our families or even just culture, that like it's okay to be like happy, joyful, anything that's pretty, right? Yeah, totally. But anything that would be ugly, like shove that under the carpet or like handle that behind closed doors or it's not okay to express that. Mm -hmm. I also think that with like the um, proliferation of all that is the law of attraction, yeah. that people get really misinformed about vibration in terms of like, oh, I can't spend too much time there, otherwise I'm going to start attracting all those things. Uh -huh. And they don't realize that it's super cumulative, right? right? Like whatever is stronger and longer. So if you need to go into like anger, sadness, grief for a bit of time, it's fine. You're not going to become this like Velcro for shitty things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because you're processing something. Right. And and the thing I love, my favorite way to articulate this, I've been borrowing from Brene Brown. Um, when Elizabeth Gilbert interviewed her on the podcast, she said, creativity that is not expressed is not benign. And you could pop creativity out of that sentence and put anything else in. Yeah. Anger that is not expressed is not oh, benign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially if you look at um, some current events, these like massive shootings and things, this is a result of people who have so much shame that hasn't been expressed, so much anger and like dark stuff totally. that it, it comes out sideways in really tragic ways. Mm -hmm. So it's just so, so important that we find space. So I think one of the big things is people need safe space for that. Yeah. And they don't know. Right? Because that, that fear of being like judged or, you know, no woman wants to be crazy, bitchy, psycho, right? And so many of us have been called that at some point in our lives by someone who couldn't handle our emotions or like did, just didn't know how and it made them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, there's a, a cesspool that we could dive into here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Well, you know, I, I want to go with that because you mentioned your partner. Yeah. And I am wondering because, you know, I've been doing a ton of studies and have done a ton of studies on, you know, men and women and in the conscious relationship and everything like that. And you guys are so great because you're both leaders and you're both teachers and coaches. And um, so I'm curious if there's any kind of um, advice you could give or maybe just reflect on your relationship if it's not too personal. Um, you know, I have a lot of women who feel like they're more evolved than their partner, you know, yeah. and it's difficult to bring that convert. And a lot of times they want to leave them, right? So yes. I'm always like, don't leave them. <laughs> like, just like, you know, you might be a little further ahead than it's your job to kind of pull them along, you know what I mean? Or, or to bring them along with you. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, how, how has he supported you in being able to express that range of emotion? And is there a way, can you, well, first, how has he supported you? And how does that help, you know, how were you able to express the anger? What was it about his solidity that allowed you to express that? And also, what advice could you give women who might be in a relationship where they don't feel free to express that way in front of their partner? 
Yeah. All right. So there's two amazing parts. I love answering this question mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's a super pet peeve of mine uh, that women, women who go, where are all the good men? Or he can't keep up with me. And it's just been the way of the world for a while that like just women have been doing more of this work than men. Mm -hmm. I have a theory because Michael does work with men. He has this thing called the school for men. Mm -hmm. I really have a theory. And even just seeing like the evolution of our relationship that there's a lot of men out there who are like ready and willing and they actually need the woman. Yeah. They need the woman who is going to be that muse in terms of evolution, mm -hmm. right? So evolutionary muse. I've never said that before, but I love the way it sounds. Yeah, that sounds great. We, we talk about the muse in terms of creativity, but what if it's like that evolutionary muse that she comes along and like through her like power, strength, groundedness, whatever it is, pull, lures him in, pulls him in that way, not in a manipulative way, but it is like an inspiration mm. because ultimately like that's, that's what's happened in our relationship. So, and I'm pointing cause he's upstairs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even on my birthday this year, he said something. He's like, yeah, I was going to write this big Facebook post, but I decided to just tell you instead. He's like, I was going to write something about like the greatest like evolutionary path for a man is to tether himself to like a wild woman, like oh. a woman who's like not going to take your shit, who's going to like hold you to your highest and best. And so it's a little different for us in the sense that, you know, we're both coaches. So we both have a lot of language and a lot of processes and, and, and an awareness um, – an intention around holding space, right? Mm -hmm. So there are times when I really, I just need to be on the floor crying and he'll just like get down on the floor with me, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Um, but he's had, he's had a lot of training in that. So I want the thing I wanted to say before I, I give any kind of other advice though, is I was at last year, the, um, women turned on women's summit. Oh, the orgasmic meditation. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I went up to teach Wild Slow Movement at their thing. And I was listening to Nicole Day Don't Speak. She's enormously polarizing. Have you ever heard her or met her or anything? I've heard her speak, yeah. Yes, yeah, so interesting. So, um, but one of the things she said, you know, this woman stood up with this eternal problem, exactly what you're asking about. Like, I just feel like I, I, no man can ever meet me, right? And whether that's, you know, in my growth, in my power, in whatever. And, and Nicole Day Don't was like, listen, I am a force. And there is not a person on this planet who can't handle me as long as I'm willing to be handled. Hmm. Because this was my issue for a while. I remember last year I also met a woman named Eva Clay at an event and I asked the same thing. And, and it really was a sneaky, sneaky way that we are choosing to create separation. Hmm. That we are actually choosing not to let people in when we want to do this like spiritually superior thing. Yeah. Right? And but here's what's still important. I get a lot of people making these decisions. Do I stay or do I go, right? For some reason this year, that's been like a huge part of my client base, people like ambivalent in these relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and for those people, two things. There's this amazing book called Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay. Okay. It's very direct. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like a series of like 40 questions. And most people don't even need to go through all 40 before they're like, oh, either I'm good or I'm out. Right. <laughs> so that's helpful from just like a practical standpoint. But the other thing I've observed is this. If the man is willing to do the work, it's, it's worth it to give him a shot. Yeah. However, if he's completely unwilling to take responsibility for any of his experience and he's still going to be in that kind of like victim-y, like blame, finger-pointing place mm -hmm. and not do anything about it, like – that's a problem because that's not going to change, right? Mm -hmm. But if someone's willing to change, like I'm willing to be patient mm -hmm. up to a point, right? Because I think there's a big, big difference between staying and settling. Yeah, It's settling when there's no indication or evidence or proof at all that this person is ever going to do anything differently. At that point, you're just hoping that they're going to transform into something they're just not. You're basically hoping for like a complete Houdini magic trick at that right. point. And it's not coming. <laughs> And if someone's like, all right, help me out. I think the other piece of it, though, is that even Michael and I both being coaches at a certain point really burned each other out processing because mm -hmm. it's like just because we can doesn't mean we should. Right. So like you do not need to be your partner's coach. Yeah. And in fact, you can't because I think one of the most amazing, important elements of any kind of coach, spiritual advisor, mentor is objectivity. And it's just the objectivity. You might you might have very loving relationships with your clients, but at the end of the day, like I'm not attached to their outcomes, right? Right. And it's 
easy for me to see and hold their highest and best vision because I don't have any of the internal limitations, beliefs, or, or life experiences that they do for them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's easy for me to keep pulling them out of that thing. But when you're with someone, you're so attached. Like yeah. you can try your best not to be, but you just – same as with your family, right? People are probably have the same experience. You go home and you're like trying to get your family to like read your books and, totally. and do your programs and they're just like they're not going to do it. Yeah, exactly. And it's not personal. Mm -hmm. It's just – but meanwhile, someone else might come and your mom might be like, oh, check out this book. And you're like, I've been telling you to read that for seven years <laughs> because someone else said it. You were open to it. Yeah. So like those little dynamics are at play as well. So – that was a lot. What what was what was good there for you? No, that was all that was all really amazing, you know, and it was great to hear you talk about that and it also brings to mind the interesting arc that you have in the book also is that the whole first part of the book is very much about, you know, the feminine essence and soul and movement and then it kind of transitions into this very practical yeah. um you know, all these like, there's even scripts that you can use for relationship and for honest and open communication. And it was a really great balance of, of both of those things, you know, to not just be off in, in fairyland and emotional land, yeah. but to say, okay, here are some other tools for this kind of communication. And it's so great to talk with you. Actually, I don't know if we've actually just like sat down like this for half an hour and talked about like yeah, these kind of yeah. specific things, but like, you're just so insightful and you have so much wisdom around all of this. So it's, it's just really great to hear all of that. I love it. Thank you. Well, and I think that's one of the reasons we've always just like kind of, even without taking the deep dive yet, just resonated because yeah. there's a groundedness to the way you and I talk about things yeah. that, you know, and again, for me, living here in Southern California now, like there's enormous like spiritual community or like conscious community. And like I use quotes because like the need to even label things like that kind of drives me a little bit nuts. Totally. But, um, it's hard. There's a lot of people that it's like hard to be around because it, the spiritual bypassing thing that you said, they're actually, their heart is in the right place, but they're super disconnected from what's actually going on. Yeah. Um, I, I just got back from Peru, as you know, and there's this amazing community down there. And I've been in other areas of the world. Like, you know, there's like one like that in Goa and in different pockets of India. And I'm sure there's ones like that in Costa Rica and like even California. But it's very interesting because they're it's, it's so much their world. It's almost that they're off the grid. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and I've been in that place myself too, where I really have had to kind of take myself out of the world. But like for me, there's just such value in bringing all of this stuff to our daily lives. Like I really yes. feel like we are spiritual beings in these bodies, but if we were just meant to be spiritual beings, we wouldn't be in these bodies. We would be, That's right. we'd just be floating around spirits around everywhere. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking of that, because, you know, my whole world is the whole divine awakening world. That's kind of, I, I lean in from that spiritual place. And you talk a lot in the book about soul. You know, your movement is wild soul movement. And you also call, um, you also use the word the divine a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, how does that come, how does that communicate with you in your life? You know, I'm Ugh. hearing all of these people now, you know, people are coming to me, like people that we both know, like friends of ours who are like, you know, high level coaches that have been doing this kind of stuff. And they're like, um, Jesus is talking to me. You know? and, yeah. they're like, and they're like, I'm getting all these downloads. I'm getting all these messages. And it's like the people that you would not expect are like, am I out of my mind? Like what's going crazy? And so I love to talk about that because it's, it's so individual for every single yes, person. Yes. And people like to hear it because then they can recognize messages and intuitions they have for themselves. Yes, so I'd love yes. to hear how that comes through for you. Oh my God. I'm so excited you're asking me this and I can talk about this here because this is like the, you know, kind of going off the deep end on the woo-woo and right, just right. like not everyone is down for that conversation. <laughs> but when someone is, I'm so excited. So what's interesting um, I've observed in myself and a lot of my friends as well is um, everyone, everyone kind of has like, like they're in their, their access points, right? And so for me, one of my first access points. So I went, I was raised Catholic. And so transitioning out of a religion and then kind of, you know, doing the exploration of, okay, what is then my spirituality? I, I always believed in some kind of God, right? That's why I like to say the divine, like that feels the most accurate to me, right? Because mm -hmm. I do believe in like a mother aspect of God, a father aspect of God. Um, sometimes the word God for me still feels associated to church, but I'm actually coming around to being more comfortable with it. Um, so at first it was like, all right, the study of like energy and subtle body and chakras. And I read Caroline Mice, Anatomy of the Spirit. Uh-huh. 
And that kind of tied it in and showed how, okay, it wasn't sacrilegious. I'm in an interview, boo. Yeah. Um, how it wasn't like sacrilegious or whatever. And then um, I was reading, this was the fall of 2013, Awakening Shakti by Sally Kempton. Uh-huh. And, and really it's like the study of feminine archetypes through Hindu goddesses. And, 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 and at that point, I was still kind of like feeling like this is when I was getting into like understanding divine feminine. And when I got to the chapter on Durga, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I've always been feminine. I'm just like warrior feminine. <laughs> ah, yes. So, so that, that was like one end point for me. But then I also was actually in a session with a, an intuitive friend of mine. She was taking me through the chakra meditation. And when we got into the upper chakras, I feel, I feel like it was maybe like 10 or something. I don't even remember at this point. But um, it was wherever ascended masters hang out. Yeah. And, and there was Jesus. Wow. And it was, in fact, Jesus. And I was like, oh, interesting. So I became super curious in studying or figuring out how to interact with Jesus outside of Christianity. Oh, interesting. And that has been just like the best. For a while, I had a Jesus cell phone case, and it triggered the hell out of everyone. It was so fun (laughs) for me. But I really, you know, I was like, I I want to have him with me everywhere. And, you know, what's the thing that's always by your freaking side? It's your phone. So I got a Jesus phone case. So, um, but then through... Again, in its books, this is one of the reasons why, to me, putting a book in the world mm-hmm. was one of the most intense like initiations of my life because I have gleaned so much from books, not just in terms of knowledge and wisdom, but just like remembering like who I am mm-hmm. and what actually speaks to me and is important to me. And um, the first time, actually, even before the Jesus stuff, I have to rewind because no one's ever asked me this before. This is so fun to see what the timeline of this was. Um, I was reading Megan Watterson's book, Reveal. Oh, great book. Yeah. And she was talking about Mary Magdalene. Mm-hmm. And as I was reading that, I was having I was like having a lot of visceral reaction to that. But then I was also remembering actually being a little girl and watching the like the Easter movie. Um, with like Charleston Heston, like the the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Commandments, but just like the Easter one, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember always being so fascinated, like, who is that other Mary, and why are they so shitty to her? <laughs> like, <laughs> even as a little kid, like, well, how come this Mary gets like all the love, and that one is like shit on? So um, then, really, a couple months after that, someone had recommended uh, the Magdalene manuscript. Have you ever read this? No. So this gets into like, you know, some esoteric stuff that some people are going to be on board with and some people aren't, but it's like a, a, a why I think a lot of people have heard the theory that like Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married, mm-hmm. but there's just so many people who have either channeled texts or written about it or done more research and and that has been like a huge heart pull for me. Mm-hmm. And then also connected to Mary Magdalene and I don't remember how this dropped in, but um just like the goddess Isis popped up. <laughs> Oh, cool. And just all these little synchronicities and all these little steps that have just led me into just like, okay, let me check this out and see what's there for me. Um, and I, I work a lot with um, like uh, oracle decks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's one way I find and practice like rituals and stuff or whatever. So so there's like uh, quite a few different layers of things, but, but through journaling and prayer and, and accessing like – through those specific like beings or whatever you want to call them, has um, really shaped a lot of my journey. I'm looking at your face and I'm like, can't wait to see what you want to say now. No, I just, I, I love it. I mean, it's, it's just so fascinating for me to hear, hear that from everyone. And actually, I have the Mystical Goddess Oracle deck I bought because in our Wild Soul session, yes. you pulled that out. And I was like, that's so cool. So amazing. <laughs> I bought it. And that's the only Oracle deck I have that I've ever had. And I bought it because of you. I loved it. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. And so, and again, but what's interesting is through books, right? Like I read Mists of Avalon. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what else was pretty pivotal for me? Um, a couple years ago, I read that Brian Weiss book, Many Lives, Many Masters. Okay. I haven't read I- that. And at that point, I had no context for past lives. Uh-huh. And when I was done with the book, I was like, well, this is obviously true. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and so this is the weirdest thing. I don't know that I've ever shared this in an interview before, but I'm just going to tell you. Um, 
because if anyone can take it, it's probably your people. I had a woman actually tell me while I was creating Wild Soul Movement, she writes these Jesus books. Mm -hmm. She, um, Durga Holzhauser is her name. Okay. And, and she remembers her past lives, writes these books about Jesus times. I don't know. But um, she told me, and, and whether this was just like symbolic or not, she said, I've seen you during Jesus times. You were a dancer in a sacred temple. And he told you, you need to go out and teach women about the sacred body. Oh, my God. So, and, and the thing is this, getting to the other part of your question, which is how do you notice your, your sensations? How do you receive? When she said that to me, I started sobbing uncontrollably. I bet. I bet. So, so for me, and that, that was something, right, over the last few years, anything that just like Megan Watterson calls it, she gets need, I just get like laid out uncontrollable sobs that seems like, like for no reason, right? Yeah, totally. Just like something hits you. It's like something burst, a, a new well or a new access point, And you're like, oh, there is, there's something true there. I don't need to know what it is, but there's something very important in what that person just said, you know? Interesting, yeah. Oh, and actually as I'm saying that, <laughs> this is so fun. I'm so glad you asked me this. Uh, <laughs> I was sitting in Grounded, a little coffee shop on Jane Street. It's like a Jane and Eighth oh, yeah. in, in the West Village. Reading A New Earth, mm -hmm. which, by the way, this is bizarre. I was ADDing a little bit earlier, and I saw it on your bookshelf back there. It oh, is yeah. so weird. It's up there I was, somewhere. I was like, of all those books, why am I honing in on this? And then it's because I had to tell you the story real quick. Um, there's like a quarter of a page somewhere in there about like the women getting burned at the stake in the Catholic Church. Uh -huh. And um, again, sitting in the coffee shop, I started sobbing my eyes out. And I felt a kind of like rage inside me that I had, have ne had never felt before. I didn't have any context or container for it. And I was like, well, I guess that matters. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so every time something like that would happen, all it would do is cause me to be like, oh, all right, note to self, pay attention yeah. and be open to receiving more information around this insight because it's clearly important to you or for you in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, the other thing I notice, goosebumps yeah. as truth. For sure. I think that one's pretty universal. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people will say that like when in front of me and I'll feel that too with people. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like a full body chill. And sometimes it's really interesting. Ever since I did my second Reiki attunement, I'll often feel like something's like kind of coming in from like there sometimes. But, you know, there's so many signals so many times and, you know, you can't, you can't pay attention to every single tiny sensation 24-7. So there's probably more that I don't even know about. But that's a pretty, that's a pretty, pretty good range there. Yeah, totally. That's amazing. I love all that. You know, I used to do, I'm doing a little bit less of it now, but I, for years I was doing a lot of bhakti work. And uh -huh. whenever I go to like the Oneness University in India where my, like, my main teachers are, um, that thing that you were talking about, that sobbing, and it's like there's no, there's no thought, there's no emotion, yep. Yep. there's no like, oh, I'm even processing out. It's just like what's in front of it's like what's in front of you is so magnificent and that Sorry. realization of it is so profound it's just like it's so overwhelming you just have to like break down in tears that's right that's right and as you were saying that i did get the goosebumps because yeah. that was just like kill like that's exactly right there's no the absence of thought right totally. the absence of having any idea what it is about the thing or need to even know but just being like washed over totally and, you know, it's interesting, like tying it all back to like all the stuff that you do, you know, the more in tune we are with our bodies, the more receptive we are to that kind that's of information, right. right? Yes, yes. And like, that's one of my constant prayers, like, like, may I just be open? Like, what would you have me know right now? Mm -hmm. um, like, that's actually when I, when I work with decks and stuff, that's usually my question. What would you have me know right now? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's in general and sometimes it's about whatever is the situation, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and just asking to like keep my eyes open. And I, I read one of the books that really helped me along the way was Tosha Silver's Outrageous Openness. Oh, I haven't have, read that either. No. Ah, uh, it's it's quite simple, especially like for someone like you. But but that's why it's so great. Um, just like reminders of just like uh, the subtitle of that is letting the divine take the lead. Ooh, I love that. And it's so good. And then and then tandem almost uh, simultaneously with that, I was reading Sonia Shokat's Ask Your Guides, mm -hmm, which that's a great one. That just helped me to be able to like communicate with the divine forces. And I talked about that in the book, like yeah. to be like, cool, they're, they're obviously there. How cool would it be to, you know, develop some kind of reliable communication system? Amazing. I love that. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just 
going to see if there's any of these questions, anything here that's really pressing that I wanted to talk about. Um, just one, one last little quick thing, because I also wanted to say I really admire this about you, that I said this kind of at the beginning of the interview, but that just, just how authentic you are. And like all of the stuff these days about, you know, I mean, Instagram, like everything is like a fucking photo shoot. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, you know, I feel like I have to prep for four hours to take a picture. You know what I mean? And, and I, I will intersperse with those. And some of my pictures are more posed and all that, whatever. But, the, you know, there are some of these accounts that, I mean, are just like magazines. You know what I mean? And it's like people yeah. go to so much trouble and expense. And there was that thing that came out with that, who was that, that young model did you see that like on, on social media a couple of weeks ago, who was like the 16 year old on Instagram and she like came out and was basically like, this is all a lie. And then she, there was an article, I'll send you the link because it's great. Oh, cool. And she said, like, she showed a picture of like her in a bikini, like, you know, sitting like this. And she, then she would write the truth of what the picture was. So she said, we took a, my sister took a hundred shots of this shot until I found one that I like where my, my tummy was flat. And this is a 16 year old. Right. And so she writes this whole thing and she had this huge video about how it's total bullshit. Everything on Instagram is a lie and how we need to start being real and authentic. And people loved it. Yeah. And there was that Amy Schumer picture that came out a day or two ago. I don't know if you saw her, you know, she was nude. And yeah. I re I actually reposted did that. I was like, nice, right on. So great. And then you posted something a day or two ago. So it was supposed to be a private picture of her mic, right? And yeah. you said, I, you know, took this in the, I think it was in Costa Rica at your retreat. You mm -hmm. said, I took this in the hotel room. It's supposed to be private, but I'm deciding to post it, you know? And I just want to applaud you for that because I think that's so incredible. And just, um, I don't know. What do you want to, what do you feel about that? And what do you want to say about that? Thank you. Yeah. And actually, so, so interesting. So this conversation came up yesterday because then a woman took like a, a, a parody picture of herself, like the Amy Schumer photo. Uh -huh. Um, and she was kind of saying, Hey, like, uh, why is this brave? Like, why does this even have to be brave? Like why do people lose their shit over just like any kind of picture of a woman? But the nuance that came up, which I thought was really interesting that I had not particularly thought about before is that if a woman is who is perceived to be out of shape, posts some kind of revealing picture of herself, we call it brave. Oh, you're so brave because like, which implies that she's supposed to be hiding that. Right. Totally. And a woman who's like beautiful and in shape posts something like that. And it, she's not called brave. She's called exhibitionist or wanting attention. Interesting, yeah. So, uh, I mean, ultimately, I think it's just, I'm really not into railing against what I don't want. I'd rather put my energy towards what I do want. So I appreciate, and like what you said, I just, the day someone stops telling me you're so authentic, oh my God, uh, you're exactly how you are in real life and then on the internet. The day I stop hearing that, I got to make some changes because I really do think in this world, like this, there's a very like fabricated world what we live in with the internet and everything else, media, Photoshop. The only thing that any of us have that, that does make us unique, that does make us stand out is actually who we really are. Yeah. So to invest the time, effort, and attention into knowing who we are on the inside, not just how we look on the outside is, is I think really the work of a lifetime. Uh, but, and, and the thing is that though, it does bother me too when people go, everything on Instagram is a lie because no, it's not. Like my stuff isn't, you know, like I, I might like move. I, I remember doing this a while ago, many months ago, I was taking a picture on my bedside table with like all my books and like water and essential oils. And I, I wrote like pictured, blah, 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 not pictured, all the shit I pushed aside. I saw that picture. post. That was great. And, totally. and I don't do that all the time. I don't call myself out on it all the time, but it's real interesting how people are often are just like so poised and ready to to pick apart what's wrong with something. Yeah. Um, it's cool though. I, I love it. I do think it's important for people to be honest about, yeah, like this took me 150 times to get this friggin' picture right. It's like it's an interesting and wild world that we live in. So I think the more important thing of anything is for we can't really manage or control other people. It's a super huge waste of energy. So when to just tune in with ourselves, like I, I always kind of check in with myself. You wouldn't believe how many things I don't post when I check in. And I'm like, why am I posting? Like, what's my intention? Am I spreading value or am I, am I actually am? Am I looking for some kind of like validation or attention or love, right? Am I seeking outside of myself for love? Because social media just lets you do that all the time. And then you get to measure how many people love me, you know? Like, so true. And it's, it's a dangerous practice. Um, 
Where sometimes for me, it's just like, is this just funny? <laughs> yeah. But simply, like, is this hilarious? So for me, like, those are my three filters. Is it, is it um, creating value? Is it entertaining? Um, or is it starting a conversation is really, is really my third one. And then the part that I check myself around on is like, why? Do you need anything right now that you could give yourself and not try to get from the internet? So um, it's a tricky and interesting space. Yeah. It is, you know, and it is because like, you know, in, in one way, you, you know, we don't want to be, you know, just the way, same way I wouldn't want my apartment to be a mess all the time. And I, you know, you have an aesthetic sense of space. It's also your connection and your value of yourself, how you present yourself to the world. So it's, it's always a balance, but I think it's, I think it's great and really valuable to have the conversation. You just like gave so many great little nuggets of your own filters, you know, and people can decide, you know, if we haven't ever considered what our filters are with that, then we don't yeah. know. So if we make conscious the idea that it is a choice, of what we put out there rather than just, you know, looking for that love or appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Elizabeth, thank you so much. There's, I, we've talked about so much stuff. It's been like, it's been like everywhere. There's so much value in here. I so appreciate it. And if you're listening, obviously, you know, that was awesome. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you the link to the Amazon book. It's two ninety nine, So obviously you have to buy it. It's a great stocking stuffer, right? If you celebrate that or for Hanukkah stuffing, I guess. Um, yeah. And it's a Kindle, so you have to like actually shove a Kindle in a stocking. But, yeah, there um, you go. You can write it on a little piece of paper and, and shove it. <laughs> I um, sent you this. <laughs> yeah, I sent you this. I've done that before. I actually do that a lot yeah. because you know that you don't have the actual physical yes, thing. So yes. but anyway, thank you so much. You're amazing. I admire you and your work, and I really appreciate your time and sharing with us today. Ah, thank you so, so much. This was so fun. Okay, yay. Bye. <laughs>